Have you ever had a thought that takes root and your brain just won't let it go? An idea that takes you down a rabbit hole where you travel beyond reason and logic? Conspiracy theories can have this effect on people. So how do we unravel fact from fiction? That is what reporter Danny Casolaro was attempting to do. Danny stumbled upon a seriously mysterious web of conspiracies that are still being untangled to this day, most recently by a documentary called American Conspiracy. However, a lot of viewers are finishing that series saying that they're confused about the core story. So today, we're taking our own trip down the octopus rabbit hole and trying to bring the focus back to what happened to Danny Casolaro. Joseph Daniel Casolaro was born into a wealthy Catholic family in McLean, Virginia on June 16, 1947. He had many interests and hobbies, and he quickly set himself apart from his large family of six siblings. Danny attended Providence College until 1968, after which he married a former Miss Virginia, Terrell Pace. They had a son, but after 10 years of marriage, they divorced, with Danny gaining full custody of their son, Trey. Throughout his life, one of Danny's main interests was writing. He wrote poems, short stories, and even had a novel called The Ice King published. Current events were what really held his attention, though, and he dabbled in journalism, exploring many different issues of the day. However, in the 1970s, he put all that on the back burner, and he bought several computer industry trade publications. After running them for a number of years... He sold them off and he decided to follow his heart. He found a story that merged his love of journalism and recent work in the computer trade. An old IT contact told him about a case involving a company called Inslaw Incorporated and the U.S. government, a case with many twists and some major implications. Danny worked on this case for over a year, and he finally felt that he was getting a handle on the vast scope of it, but with that new knowledge also came a new fear, a fear for his life. Inslaw was a technology company that marketed case management software for prosecutors in the court system. The U.S. government knew that it had to start using computers to move away from traditional paper-based record keeping to computerized records that could be linked across jurisdictions. Inslaw could help provide this, and in a time without the prevalence of the internet, a new application called Promise was created. Short for Prosecutor's Management Information System, this program could take raw data from multiple systems and pull it together, combining it into a new database which enabled the user to track people specifically by their involvement with the legal system. Bill Hamilton, president of Inslaw, said, quote, It was always a tracking program. It was designed to keep track of cases in local U.S. attorneys' offices, but... Some of our users wanted to have it shared with the courts and the police, so the software was engineered to make it highly adaptable. A byproduct was that made it adaptable totally outside the criminal justice system. When the U.S. government saw the capabilities of Promise, they started funding Inslaw's work through a Law Enforcement Assistance Administration, or LEAA, grant. When Congress abolished the grant in the 1980s, Inslaw saw a chance to make even more money than they could in their current state as a nonprofit organization. In the early 1980s, the government signed a three year, $10 million contract that saw promise being used in many cities and government offices. But if Inslaw could also offer the program as a private product to corporations, they could potentially make billions of dollars. Unfortunately, it seems that the U.S. government saw the same potential in the program, and maybe even more. Inslaw's lawsuit alleged that after upgrades were applied to the program, the government essentially stole the software, modifying it and distributing it themselves to foreign governments. Inslaw's contract led to over a decade of legal battles, all of their early attempts being thwarted and finding no fault with the U.S. government, despite a lot of information to support that the government just was not acting in good faith with Inslaw. And there was another catch. A version of promise was created that would be given to other countries for them to use, but supposedly this version had a back door 
that allowed the U.S. to spy on foreign intelligence operations. That was just one part of what Danny saw in a vast web of conspiracies. This was one of the arms of what he called the octopus. It's Monday, August 5th, 1991, and so far, Danny has researched the octopus for over a year. No matter where the story took him, there seemed to be no real conclusion, and Danny was led further and further down a confusing path filled with government spooks and misdirection. Soon, friends and family were worried about him. Danny told one friend that Time Magazine was going to carry the octopus, that he was working with a reporter named Jack Anderson, and that publishers Little, Brown, and Time Warner were all financing the whole thing. In contradiction to another friend, just days later, he complained about not being able to sell the manuscript. He also complained about losing sleep due to mysterious and threatening anonymous late-night telephone calls. At one point, Danny's housekeeper, Olga, helped him pack for a trip to Martinsburg, West Virginia, where he was to meet a source who promised to fill in the blanks of his story. While she packed his bag, Danny packed up what she called a thick sheaf of papers into a briefcase. August 9th, at 2.30 p.m., Danny met with a Honeywell engineer at the Sheraton Hotel. The man gave Danny some documents, and after speaking for a few minutes, they left. From there... Danny was seen drinking at a Martinsburg restaurant where he was described as seeming lonely and depressed. He stayed there for a few hours until he was next seen at a cocktail lounge called Heatherfields around 5 p.m., drinking with a man described as, quote, maybe Arab or Iranian. At 5.30, Danny ran into the man who was renting the room next to him, a man named Mike Looney. Looney saw him again at 8, and Danny claimed that he was about to meet a source who was going to give him what he needed to finish his manuscript. At 9 p.m., Danny left Looney to make a phone call, and when he returned, he claimed that his source had blown him off. The two talked for about a half hour before parting ways. The last sighting of Danny that night was around 10 p.m. when he bought coffee at a nearby convenience store. On August 10, 1991, just past noon, housekeeping staff knocked on Danny's door, and after receiving no answer, they entered. They found a gruesome, blood-filled scene that was so graphic one of the women fainted. Officers arrived to find Danny, dead, lying naked, in a bathtub full of water and blood, with a shoelace wrapped around his neck. When paramedics arrived, water was drained from the tub and his body was removed, Both wrists had been deeply slashed in what appeared to be self-inflicted wounds. Under his body, they found two white plastic paper basket liners, plus an empty can of Milwaukee beer and a razor blade. They also found a half-empty bottle of wine nearby, and not much else. The rest of the room appeared to be neat and orderly. On the desk, they found a note that read in part, Please forgive me, most especially my son, and be understanding. God will let me in. With no witness accounts of his final moments, it appeared that Danny had taken his own life. When the room was checked for fingerprints, only Danny's were found. Investigators wrapped things up quickly, and they took his body away for processing. When the family was finally notified, days later, they were in complete shock, None of them believed Danny would do this, especially in the manner that he was found. He was very squeamish of needles and blood, and they found it impossible that he would choose to die that way. However, that wasn't the most shocking thing that they shared with investigators. Danny's brother and other family members stated that in the months leading up to his death, he had started to receive death threats and threatening phone calls that he felt were connected to his work on the octopus. Olga even corroborated those claims. The day that Danny left for his trip, she answered several calls at his home. The first was at 9 a.m. when a man threatened, I will cut his body and throw it to the sharks. Less than an hour later, a different man said, drop dead. In the third and fourth calls, no one spoke, but she could hear music from a radio playing in the background. All the other calls that night were silent. Two months before his death, Danny told his brother that if he died by accident in the near future, don't believe it. 
Most importantly, everyone wanted to know where Danny's ever-present briefcase and what they called his accordion file of papers, where was it? This was something he always carried as it contained research and his manuscript for the octopus. Nothing like that had been found by police. All they had were some newspaper clippings and handwritten notes found in his room. At the behest of the family, an autopsy was performed on August 14th, the findings of which have to be called into question because at that point, his body had already been embalmed. Regardless, the coroner found that Danny had died from blood loss, with death occurring anywhere from one to four hours before he was discovered. They found eight cuts to his left wrist and four cuts to his right that were described as very painful to inflict on oneself, and at least one cut had completely severed a tendon. Unhappy with both the investigation and autopsy findings, five months later, in January of 1992, a second autopsy was performed. The verdict was pretty much the same, although this one offered a toxicology report. It showed traces of antidepressants, acetaminophen, and alcohol, but stated that none of the levels were enough to incapacitate Danny. According to American Forensics, embalming does interfere with toxicology studies. We know Danny had been witnessed drinking all evening before his death, and several empty or near-empty alcohol containers were found in his room. Danny's family also stated that Danny did not do drugs, and he took no prescription medications. Kind of interesting, considering the antidepressants that were found. As his family looked through the hodgepodge mixture of notes and clippings that were left behind, they started to sense the vast arms of this conspiracy that Danny saw stretching from our government and into the world. Nearly all of these claims hinged on the testimony of a single man, a man named Michael Reconosciuto. Reconosciuto was referred to as a genius. At age 10, he wired up his neighborhood with a private telephone system that quote, undercut Ma Bell. In his teenage years, he was invited to be a summer research assistant at Stanford University. Most importantly, he was a computer expert who claimed he was the one who built the database backdoors into those versions of promise that were sold throughout the world. In a 12-page memo provided to Danny, Reconosciuto spoke of modifying promise at the Cabazon Indian Resort near Indio, California. With the sovereign status that the reservation carried, he claimed that many secret government experiments were built and tested there. Once Promise was sold to other countries, the proceeds were then used in a number of different ways, more of these turning into their own legs of the octopus. Money from Promise would be connected to the closure of BCCI, the Bank of Credit and Commerce International. From there, it branches into Iran-Contra, the fabrication of new, powerful secret weapons, and many other things that we won't go into here. That's part of the issue with Danny's story. There are just so many legs of the octopus, and honestly, they never seem to end. There was one of particular interest, though. The alleged Ronald Reagan October Surprise Conspiracy. On November 4th, 1979, 66 Americans were taken hostage in Iran. Jimmy Carter, the sitting president, had been unable to secure their release. To make sure that Ronald Reagan won the election the following year, Reconosciuto claimed that he and a man named Earl Bryan paid $40 million to Iranian officials to keep those hostages held until the conclusion of the election, which would see Reagan elected and the hostages released just moments after he gave his inauguration address. In exchange for helping Reagan, Brian was reportedly paid off with some of the profits from Promise. Countries were now using their versions of the program to track political dissidents and people that they consider to be enemies of the state. Even back here in the U.S., Oliver North allegedly used Promise to do the very same thing for Ronald Reagan. In 1991, Reconosciuto filed an affidavit with the House Judiciary Committee that was investigating Inslaw's case against the U.S. government. He testified before Congress that promise had indeed been stolen and modified by him. Eight days later, he was arrested on 10 counts of manufacturing and distributing methamphetamine and methadone. 
No evidence was found to support this massive operation, but he was convicted. Reconosciuto has always maintained his innocence. The House Intelligence Committee conducted a six-hour interview with him that they described as wild and squirrely. He claimed that the government set him up to keep him quiet. And apparently it worked. He would spend over 25 years in prison, eventually being released in 2017. Inslaw is still in business with many legitimate promised customers, including governments of other countries, though Inslaw suspects that they also have several pirated copies of Promise still floating around out there. They were once contacted by the Canadian government asking for a full user's manual. Inslaw had never sold the product to Canada. Despite a back and forth battle, the Department of Justice has ultimately been found to have done no wrong to Inslaw. The cross section of Danny Casolaro's death and Michael Reconosciuto's story leaves us with numerous questions, some that just seem unanswerable. Can we believe Reconosciuto's seemingly wild claims just because they touch on known true events and mention people that we all know? Is it possible that he himself is a conspiracy theorist that maybe gave Danny what he was looking for, an ending to his octopus story, by simply convincing Danny of these stories, injecting himself as a character into many of them? Why are there seemingly so many problems with the scene of Danny's death? The extremely painful cuts to his wrist for someone that isn't comfortable with blood, one of those cuts severing a tendon. The note left behind also reportedly had no signature. When Danny's room was checked for prints, only his fingerprints were found, but how's that possible? In any hotel room, you're likely to find prints from other occupants as well as cleaning staff. Some people think that that proves that the room had been wiped down to clear anything incriminating. It has also been reported that the hotel had the room deep cleaned in a matter of days, but of course, considering that a death had occurred there, I don't know that I find that necessarily odd. Investigators said they found no signs of forced entry, but we know that Danny was reportedly meeting someone in the area. Could he have invited someone back to his room? What about the shoelace found around his throat? It's been speculated that the waste paper bags that were found with his body could have been placed over his head and then the shoestring tied around them to try to suffocate him. Could that have been done by someone else, and there was a struggle and the bags were removed? Speaking of struggle, another of Danny's hobbies in life was amateur boxing. That would seem to suggest that he had means to reasonably defend himself. Shouldn't there be more signs of a struggle on and around his body? And there's one of the most mysterious events said to have happened at Danny's funeral. A story has been told about a man who was described as a highly decorated military officer wearing U.S. Army dress, arriving at the funeral with another man in plain clothes in a limousine. The man in uniform approached Danny's coffin, laid a medal on the lid, saluted, and left. The casket was lowered into the ground and buried before the family could find out what the medal was or who it was for, and no one knows who either of the mystery men were. While this was included on a segment done by Unsolved Mysteries, some people discuss and wonder if it ever actually occurred or if this is just more lore being added to these conspiracy theories. One report, written by a House Judiciary Committee after years of investigation into the Inslaw affair, does have an interesting note, though. Quote, Investigate Mr. Casalero's death. The report states, as long as the possibility exists that Danny Casolaro died as a result of his investigation into the Inslaw matter, it is imperative that further investigation be conducted. And if he did end his own life, where exactly is his manuscript? If you're enjoying this show, please check out Seriously Mysterious, the podcast. We have over 150 episodes waiting for you.